Good morning, students. Um, it's an honor to be here. I want to thank you, Dr. Vallely and Dr. Williams, for inviting me. And uh, it's always a pleasure to spend time with you. So it's my, um, I just want to say the, the thing about Health Canada is we never broke up, <laughs> okay? It, was, it's, it's, it wasn't on and off. It was a ongoing relationship with the Office of Control Substances. I, I personally got to know on a first name basis, I think eight different directors um, and uh, many of the staff. And it's most interesting that there's actually one person who uh, has been on the file from the very beginning and, and is still working in the office. So, uh, and he uh, took the, uh, made the request to phone me when the exemption finally came in and, and was able to say to me, it's 17 years, I've been working on your file and I just want you to know that the, your exemption's in the mail, it's on the way. So uh, it's been a very interesting time. So today, uh, what I'm going to be speaking about is the Santo Daimi and Theogen's consciousness and spiritual evolution. And, and try and consider, next slide please. The first thing that we will be doing is looking at our perspective. Okay, what do we have here? We have a wonderful picture of the Milky Way galaxy. As if we're standing in a beautiful night looking out at the stars and seeing our place in the cosmos as a human being on planet Earth. But how we perceive ourselves in the world depends on the vantage point. Next slide, please. Okay, different vantage point. Now we're out in the stars looking back. The blue jewel in our solar system. Next slide, please. Now, some of you may be familiar with this photograph. Actually, NASA has remastered it a little bit. And everybody knows, I hope, what Voyager is, which was an unmanned spacecraft. Actually, there was two, one, and two that went out to explore our solar system. And just as it was getting out of the solar system, it, it was programmed to turn around and look back at Earth. And so this is Earth from 8 billion miles away. Um, I believe it's about 18 billion miles away now in Voyager. It's still going, still exploring. So just to, to set the stage that how things look, how we perceive them, really depends on where we're standing and where our mind is at and what our perception is. Next slide, please. So um, just to say a, a couple of words about sacred plants, entheogens, uh, uh, I had a brief overview of some of the topics you've uh, opened into in this course and uh, I'm not sure exactly what has been covered so some things I won't be covering um, due to time constraints and some things I hope to have uh, the time to go into a little bit more in depth. Entheogens themselves are sacred plants that have been used in throughout human history cross-culturally worldwide um, for millennia, millennia, millennia. And uh, we, some key points that we need to hold dear are that these are, the use is mostly community based. Um, what I should have also put here is also medicinally based, uh, but still within the community setting. And uh, so these plants are used for initiation, for rituals, for divination, but they're also used medicinally. Uh, next slide, please. The Santo Daimi, what is it? The Santo Daimi is a path, it's a practice, it's also the name of our sacrament. Some of you may know this sacrament is ayahuasca, however, ayahuasca is the name of the vine and ayahuasca is kind of an umbrella term that uh, more or less includes any, any brew that is made with the vine. Whereas the Santo Daimi and also the Unio de Vistal, which is kind of a sister uh, religion in, in not just in Brazil, but it started in Brazil, uses the exact same sacrament. There's only two plants in our sacrament. So we have the vine, Banisteria capi, and we have the leaves of the tree, Psychotheria viridis. So um, together there's water, there's fire, there's prayers, there's hymns, and it's called the Ficio, in which the sacrament is made. It is considered to be the most important uh, ritual uh, at the core of the Santo Daimi tradition, which is the collecting of the leaves in the vine uh, in the branch that we are in, and hopefully in all of the Santo Daimi, certainly in the Union of the Vegetal and the Barquina, another small branch off the Santo Daimi, 
all established early on in Brazil uh, in the early part of the last century. And uh, the plants are only harvest sustainably. Uh, we won't be talking about ayahuasca tourism today. That is a whole other conversation around what has been happening with these plants as they have been um, popularized uh, through social media and uh, all kinds of other uh, ways and means. So the Santa Baimi itself, I remember at the core is the sacrament, uh, is a syncretic Christian-based practice. Now, how did that happen? Okay, this here's here's this these sacred plants that have been used for some say hundreds, some say thousands of years in the Amazon basin, and all of a sudden here's this this syncretic Christian-based practice, and in part it happened because Nestorio um, is the descendant of slaves brought over into the Amazon region uh, in the Acre area. Uh, for the rubber tapping plantations and uh, he brought with him or his family brought with him many of the African beliefs and traditions and so those stayed uh, to some degree in the Brazilian area and to this day you will find a lot of those practices in the Brazilian and the Amazon area have been influenced so we have the Ewaskira roots we have the African roots, beliefs and, and systems beliefs. Then we have the Christianity, folk Christianity, um, that kind of became part of the path because of the, um, you know, the Im imposition of the Catholic faith in South America, not just in South America, but in South America, um, in the Brazilian area. Um, when the Europeans came bringing their religion, their main religion at the time. And so, and as the, the Santo Daime continued to grow and develop, it started to embrace uh, some Eastern traditions. And that happened in some European spiritism. And it, it became a very eclectic, syncretic uh, path. Now, part of that was simply rooted in the um, what's called the Mirasals or the visions of the Santa Daimi. Um, Maestri met the Buddha in the astral. And so it's hard to keep the door closed uh, when you have these personal encounters. And so in, in, it's in this manner that elements of the tradition and ritual started to embrace. Uh, next slide, please. The core principles of the Santo Daimi are love, harmony, truth, and justice. Those are the four pillars of the foundation of the principles and the tradition and the practice. And again, central to the tradition is this is our sacrament. Um, here you have uh, someone um, uh, stirring the pot, the fichio pot. So you can see bits of the vine, you can see the leaf, and uh, it's always done in silence, only prayers and, and singing hymns. And usually a fichio can take anywhere from minimum three to seven days in which members of the community, and it's day and night, so you, people come and do a shift and, and, and work in the fichio continuously until the fichio is finished. Next slide, please. Now, why are we drinking this sacrament? Uh, it's a calling. The plants call us. Uh, before I went to Brazil in, in 1996, um, I had been dreaming for a few years. I had been having profound spiritual experiences since I was a young child. But a couple of years before I went to Brazil, I started dreaming about being in the forest wearing white and drinking. <laughs> um, this rather seemed in my dream strange concoction. And there would be this voiceover. Uh, you know the voice, everybody. I can't see you all. I can only see a couple of of people, but I'm going to assume that some of you might be nodding, um, that you recognize the voice, the voice that speaks to you in dreams, in meditations, and and it gives you uh, a kind of connection to inner wisdom, to your higher self, uh, to unity, to wisdom. Okay, And I was seeing this, and so when the opportunity came, it's, uh, it's as if spirit and the plants had already been preparing me. So the sacrament, these plants awaken consciousness. They expand and awaken consciousness. They, they can provide a direct experience with the divine. 
uh, the messages that we receive when we take the sacrament are personal, deeply personal, things that no one else could know about us outside of us. So it's as if there is a knowingness, um, an awakening of a knowingness. And we also can receive universal messages, messages that have universal meaning and universal truth and significance. Uh, currently, the plants have a sustained message that they are reach, trying to reach out through the taking of these plants, respect and preserve nature. Next slide, please. Okay, international expansion. It became, the Santa Daime became a worldwide movement in the 1990s. Um, Nestor O'Neill had trained for six years with the Ayahuascaras, and then he felt called by the plants, his own experiences. Um, he was told, the plants told him to go into the forest and to do his initiation alone for, for a week, and he did. And during that time, he had this profound encounter with the Divine Feminine through the full moon. And uh, the Divine Feminine gave him the instructions to begin the Santa Daimi path. And so he did. Some close friends and companions uh, started to join him, and then it spread out through that little area, and then it spread out through Brazil and through other parts of South America, and then it became a worldwide movement with uh, branches in 34 countries at this point. Recognized and protected in Brazil in the United States since the uh, challenging work of Jeffrey Bronfman of the Unio de Vegetal, um, what is it, some 15 years ago now, uh, when he battled to the Supreme Court to win the right to be able to import and serve their sacrament, Wasca of the Unio de Vegetal. Some European members also, and of course Canada. There have been some challenges with expansion. Um, that's a whole other talk, maybe for another day. Next slide, please. So to Montreal. So founded in 1997, uh, when I returned from Brazil in 1996, it was very clear after my initiations in the Santo Daime that I would be bringing the path home with me and would be, and I already had a, you know, a group of transpersonal friends. The next thing I know, we had a church. Um, we formalized it and opened it in 1997 and spent 14 years under the supervision of the elders and senior staff of the line that we were with at the time. We became independent in 2010 uh, for a lot of reasons. Those of you who are interested, you can uh, read uh, on our website, Soda Montreal, from Orthodoxy to Universalism, and uh, hope you find it interesting. It can, doesn't contain all of the reasons uh, why we made that step. Um, that can be found in other places, um, but it was layered. And uh, it's a very interesting discourse to see how it was imperative to make the transition of this particular path into the Canadian culture and into this era. And um, it's always fascinating to see in religions how, how much is the, the spiritual tradition and the principles and how much is local culture. And, and you know, again, that's a whole other conversation. So. It has been um, my calling and, uh, and the work in our church to do the foundational work. The Santa Daime was a, a oral tradition. And uh, when I first entered it, nothing was really written down, just uh, some hymn books. Um, everything is apprentice, okay? It's an apprenticeship path, which is normal. However, in our culture and for our government and to be able to achieve legalization, certain things had to be codified. And so I wrote a code of ethics inspired by my uh, t training and work with uh, Jack Cornfield, the American uh, Buddhist teacher and psychologist. And um, I codified the tenets of the faith. They'd never been codified. And our government was asking me, what do you believe? So they had to be codified. All of our visitors' information and screening process, um, there are contraindications for our sacrament. Some of them are medical and some of them are psychological and organizational norms and standards, um, uh, working on uh, continuing to work on that. Uh, next slide, please. Legalization. It 
It started in 2000. It was an interesting beginning, and I went under um, two RCMP investigations. And if you've never been investigated by the RCMP, it's interesting. Um, first of all, they comb through your whole life. Um, the first thing I knew was, you know, I'd been quietly importing it with the correct documents from Brazil, um, knowing that the shoe was going to drop and just trying to get us prepared for to be able to go forward and uh, with the appropriate agricultural documents, um, it being a protected plant, a uh, heritage plant. And so I, all my documents were in line. So when this happened, I was, be able, I was able to present myself. We, we had the good fortune of having a very remarkable detective, RCMP detective, who was very sympathetic to what we were doing. And he says, listen, you need to get an exemption. And he smiled and he says, it may take you a while. Well, it did. It took 17 years. In 2006, we were granted an exemption in principle, and which unfortunately, because of governmental problems in Brazil and export permission, and we got caught between 2007 and 2012 uh, with an delays on a number of fronts. Uh, first of all, the Conservative Party was coming in and they were starting to close certain programs that, uh, within their own policies that they did not agree with. And so uh, we were finally told that they were closing our exemption. The Conservative Health Minister at the time informed us that, no, we would not be able to do this. And at the same time, closed many other programs across Canada that were considered to be under the same kind of umbrella. So um, in 2013, I called up my friend Jeffrey Bronfman and I said, we need to work together to achieve this. And so we did. We united our our uh, efforts and fundraise to pay for the necessary lawyers and experts that we needed. And in 2017, finally, after a government change, um, our exemption was granted. Next slide, please. So let's talk about consciousness for a moment. At, uh, at the beginning, if you remember the first slide, I said that it expands or awakens consciousness. What is consciousness? Well, uh, we believe it's a fundamental aspect of the universe. Was it present at the Big Bang, at the origin of the universe? Was it consciousness that awoke physical matter reality? We have no idea. No one can answer these questions, right? We may have glimpses into the great mystery, but no one has the answers, and I don't think any one human being can. Next slide, please. So, consciousness. Consciousness is not in the physical body. Uh, those of you interested, um, I did an extremely brief recommended reading at the end, but I might toss out a few more names as we go along. Larry Dossey, D-O-S-S-E-Y. I would highly recommend his work, um, especially his book, One Mind, uh, on, on um, understanding how our mind is not in our brain, and our mind is not the product of our brain. So all modern, you know, next slide, please. So the brain mediates consciousness the same way um, Zoom is mediating this meeting, okay? But it is not the source of consciousness. So Zoom is not the source of our conversation today. And it is simply the mediating principle, the channel for our conversation. Modern science is aligning with the great spiritual traditions about the nature of human consciousness on the frontiers of modern science. And isn't it fascinating? Those of you who perhaps have studied in, are studying in, or planning to study in modern science, please do. Physics, um, what's happening in neuroscience, fascinating. Astrophysics, biology, epigenetics. The new biology is extraordinary and really confirming and aligning with what great masters, teachers, and has been said in spiritual traditions um, for thousands of years. All merging into the great mystery. So mystics on one side and sages are feeling their way into the great mystery and on the frontier, perhaps not quite on the other side, but um, somewhere along the edge of the great mystery, they're feeling along and we're finding out that the language is different, the vocabulary is different. However, what we're trying to say and the message is all the same. Next slide, please. 
Okay, non-ordinary states of consciousness are at the root of our spiritual practice. Um, it, it expands consciousness. So let's talk about non-ordinary states of consciousness. There is no general definition why. Okay, why is there no general definition? Because then we'd have to rely on definition definition of a normal state of consciousness, which doesn't exist. So when we accept that consciousness is always something that is slightly, it's just like awareness or focus, the same way our energy, we can notice it throughout the day, we have these biorhythms. And these biorhythms indicate the level of energy that we have available, mental, physical, emotional, etc. And so it's the same with consciousness. Our state of consciousness is, you know, we're highly alert and then we're not so aware and then we, you know, trip over something that's in front of us. And so our level of awareness and consciousness is something that is, is flexible and let's hope resilient. Next slide, please. So in many cultures, the history of non-ordinary states of conscious not only mediated by entheogens, because I think that we need to understand that um, entheogens are, um, how can I use it? Um, I think the best way is to use the kind of microscope and telescope. Remember, it's just an analogy. It's not perfect, but it's a usable one. When we look at the back of our hand, for example, uh, we see our skin, we see our skin a certain way, but if we take a microscope, then it, we see an entire other world there. Nothing's changed, it's just our skin, but our perception, our ability to see what is there has changed vastly. The same way we can go out tonight and look at the stars or the moon. Well, in downtown Montreal, I won't be seeing so much of the sky with all the ambient light, but take a telescope and look at the moon or the stars and it's a whole other thing and then take the Hubble telescope and look into the cosmos that's a whole other thing entirely and so one can say that entheogens are a little bit like the Hubble telescope okay and um, the non-ordinary state okay so the, whether it's the telescope or the microscope but the ability to look in and perceive in a way that is so expanded from our everyday <clears throat> So non-ordinary states of consciousness have been an integral part of everyday life in rituals, rites of passage, and daily practice. People have been meditating, fasting, um, sensory deprivation, uh, solitude, vision quest, uh, all of these experiences, trance singing, trance dancing, trance drumming, um, using music, song, and chants to enter into, an, more often than not, as a community-based experience where the community is holding the energy of that. Unfortunately, Western civilization, uh, our end of the world, lacks non-ordinary states of consciousness as a cultural norm. It was dismissed as a field of scientific inquiry during the early 20th century, where non-ordinary states were often pathologized and labeled, and sadly, to this day, a lot of what in the transpersonal field would be considered spiritual emergency um, is considered to be mental illness. And for those of you interested in that work, Dr. John Nelson's book, Healing the Split, uh, would be an interesting read. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so throughout human history, cross-culturally, non-ordinary states of consciousness have played a very important role. Humans seek transcendent experiences we seek it. There's something inside of us. We are terrified of it and we are seeking it all at the same time. Deep inner exploration and transformation. So we have these, this inner push and pull and this is kind of a universal experience in which we long for transcendent experiences while we're frightened of them. We long to deeply know ourselves. At the same time, there's parts of ourselves that we kind of don't want to know and don't want to see. Okay, we long for transformation. We're tired of the caterpillar life. We want to be the butterfly. But actually going into that, you know, chrysalis for, for a while and, and changing and shedding or being the snake and shedding the skin or the peacock and shedding the scale, that deep level of transformation we have to take ownership of. It's t very exciting, but it can be very scary. So the experience of the non-ordinary states of consciousness is beyond mental and theoretical nature. In other words, we can study it, we can look at it, uh, we can experience it. Uh, an analogy I, I sometimes use is, is on the scuba diver. 
and um, you know, there's people who've never seen the ocean, never seen, maybe they live in the middle of the desert and their concept of water is what you can get from the oasis and jugs and try to explain the entire other universe that is uh, beneath the waves and that there's an entire other dimension of life experience there. And so that's what the non-ordinary state gives us. It gives us this opportunity to explore uh, realms and dimensions of consciousness that are not readily available in our regular state of consciousness. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So once we see that, you know, I, I happen to love this image, but once we see that I am a self and I am the cosmos, and we can experience this not just on a psycho-spiritual level, we can understand it on a physical level, that the phosphorus in our bones is, is comes from when the pl plants were first formed, that we are in this intricate relationship with nature in which we are um, we are living and breathing. We are not separate from nature and we are not separate from the stars and the cosmos. We are actually one with that. And when we are willing to embrace that we are one with all things, then our individual identity uh, takes a shift. It needs to. And uh, this can, again can be exciting and challenging. Okay, next slide, please. Non-ordinary states are states outside of our everyday awareness that go beyond our everyday perceptions. They can lead to self-awareness, personal transformation, spiritual opening, and the development of new perceptions of and strategy to life. Once we have a, an expanded sense of consciousness, it is, it's very difficult to pack it back down into the old box. Um, uh, people who've been in my study, it's actually on the wall I'm facing, is I have this whole wall full of uh, mythological archetypal imagery. And, um, you know, uh, one of them is, is Persephone and um, uh, the box that gets opened. And once that box is opened, you can't cram it back in. Now, where were we? Oh yes, information about the human psyche, consciousness, and the nature of reality. Uh, those of you who saw the movie Matrix, um, I, I like science fiction, um, and uh, those of you who saw it, perhaps you might remember, uh, there's a, a section where somebody asks to be plugged back in, reality is too difficult, plug me back into the illusion. And so if we look at our, and this is again is a segue, it's an entire other lecture, if we look at our culture and we see the trouble that our culture is in, I wonder how much of it has to do with our lack of spiritual connection, our lack of connection with nature, our, tr our lack of true connection with community. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Rumi, if you don't know Rumi, go exploring. You are not a drop in the ocean, you are the ocean, you're a drop. So, it's, it's easy to get, it's hard to get. It's easy to get, it's hard to get. Next slide, please. In the non-ordinary states of consciousness, it becomes possible to expand our view of the cosmos and of ourselves. It provides an opportunity to transform the past, old traumas, biography, birth. Uh, the best maps of the self I can offer you are the maps of um, Roberto Saccioli, the Italian psychiatrist, his work, and Dr. Stanislav Grof, his work. And um, he added into the maps of the cartography of the human experience and the human um, uh, soul, spirit, body, um, um, not just beyond bi biography, he added in the birth, so important in the transpersonal realms, uh, Jung and then uh, Jung's work and then Asagioli's work and then Stan Groff's work. For those of you who are in that field, would be the path I would invite you to follow and read up on. It helps us to resolve karma. Now this is a bit of a tricky piece. I'd like to, if it, I hope you're interested. I can't see any of you except Dr. Vallali. Um, so I have no idea um, if uh, you'd like to spend a minute on this, but I would resolve karma. How do we do that? Uh, well, what's really interesting is, is this past life research that's been done in past life. Um, 
the information that's been available, it's really difficult to study this. And um, because again, it's all non-ordinary states. And is it our, our past life experiences, are they a kind of a theater uh, when we explore them, when they come up for, uh, for us? Is it, some, is it somehow an inner theater? Is it our, uh, a narrative of something that's being given to us that we can understand something? Is it that we are connecting into the collective unconscious and we're vibrating with or picking up stories from uh, whatever that's called, the collective unconscious, the Akashi records, the, you know, ancestral memories, uh, whatever we're going to call that. Um, is that what we're picking up or did we actually live that life? Now, what's really interesting is if you, if you are interested in this and you do read up on it, there's some excellent literature. It's very limited and there's some not such good literature, so be careful what you read. But interestingly enough, is most powerfully, people will say, and Stan Groff in one of his books, he tells a story about how he accessed and resolved a past life. And I can speak to this. I don't know about any of you, but a lot of my past life material comes up in dreams. Now, this is quite interesting because uh, doing dream work, um, I had a private practice up until 2018. So close to 40 years of working with people. And uh, in dream work and regression work, what, what's fascinating is our dreams will often be where we are exploring this material and where it is trying to resolve. And I think the, the biggest takeaway that we can have for this is that it is part of our spiritual evolution to resolve karmic patterns. And if we have the world view, which is what we have in the Santa Daimi, that we are a reincarnating soul, and that we are here to explore and discover and learn and transform, then resolving karmic patterns becomes a very interesting part of our personal work. It helps us, so the non-ordinary state also helps us to change our life narrative. It helps us to change how we're living our life in the now. This is the one, the life you're in is the important one, by the way. And I personally never discovered that I was anybody important, by the way. Everything I discovered were very ordinary, very ordinary human lives. But that there was patterns. I, I could, in, in actually, in one in Santa Dami ritual, I was shown a pattern that was in this present in this life that went back 6,000 years, lifetime after lifetime, back and forth between one side and the other of various religions. And it was a fascinating pattern. And seeing it and understanding it gave me a profound understanding of how to transform my relationship to certain things in this lifetime. Next slide, please. This is a, a chart that I, I made a few years ago to help me explain individual and expanding consciousness. So we start back down with the individual mind, which we, you know, my mind has my thoughts in it. No one's ever going to argue this. Okay, my thoughts are my thoughts. Your thoughts are your thoughts. Okay, then we have our, per so we have our personal unconscious. Then we have our family unconscious. And then the tribe or clan or community. So, and then we have our national unconscious. I hope everybody's still with me. I can almost feel that there's questions that people want to ask. <laughs> and um, so the, the Canadian national unconscious would be different from the... Japanese national unconscious or the Australian Aboriginal unconscious, right? There's different stories in those lines. Then there would be the global human unconscious and that would connect to Gaia, the world's unconscious. Then there's the collective or universal unconscious and then there's the great mystery, the I have no idea what's out there. So a little chart to help understand how deeply layered uh, consciousness is and the ability to you know if somebody didn't know what a microscope was and then you looked at the hand and then you looked at through the microscope you have no idea what you were looking at what am I looking at okay truly what am I looking at and um, this can happen for people when they first take entheogens the experience can be so profoundly expanding that at first they have no idea what they're perceiving so let's Let's go to the next slide, please. Expansion of consciousness. 
So this is just some steps of what happens uh, when we take entheogens or when we take our sacrament, the Santo Daimi. This is a threshold experience. And a lot of this information is almost identical to uh, the research on uh, near-death experiences. Possibly some of you um, have read up on that. It's something that I, I would highly recommend is read up on near-death experiences. I think I have one or two people named in the recommended reading. Um, again, there's there's good <laughs> research and, and writings and not such good stuff, so be careful what you read. And so in the, in the near-death experience, in the spontaneous non-ordinary state of consciousness, uh, the out-of-body experience, these spontaneous experiences that are not, that can happen just like that, um, they can be um, uh, initiated or set off by stress, by giving birth, by a major change in your life, and sometimes they just arrive. And so there is a threshold experience, a shift of energy and or consciousness. You'll feel something. Some people describe it as a click or a sound or a humming or a vibration. And that takes you into the sensory changes where you have sensations, sounds, visuals, often accompanying emotions. You might experience fear, okay, as one is realizing that one must let go of a certain level of control and uh, a certain worldview and control needs to be let go of. Then there's a transitional phase. It is experienced very commonly in the Santo Daimi as reaching a gate. And there's usually a being or a presence or an energy or a force or a light that's there at the gate or a tunnel, a breakthrough experience, a crossing over or an entrance into another realm. These are the common um, shared experiences in, in entheogen and um, uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness, large shifts such as the near-death experience. <clears throat> there can be the state of dual or multi-awareness of self and the nature of reality. I'm me, but I'm somehow not me. I'm, I have my awareness, but I have this cosmic awareness. So there's this dual awareness and reality. Encounters with intelligent beings and beings. Now you see there's a small b and a big b, and that's just me. Um, there's beings and there's being. And they communicate uh, in a way that's telepathic, um, that uses sound, sensation, and uh, they appear to be able to discern one's entirety. Um, the first time I took uh, Santo Daimi, <coughs> In 1996, um, I thought I had prepared myself as best as I could uh, through meditation and following the dietary and, you know, what felt like a hundred lifetimes of personal work and therapy and, and training with Stan Groff, and I felt reasonably prepared. Um, oh, good luck. Uh, there is no full preparation. Uh, there's a readiness and as much as you can prepare. And what happened was uh, within 20 minutes of, of, of taking the daimi and sitting in my place, I realized that I was negotiating a new relationship with gravity and that um, uh, that there was this gateway experience of intense light. I felt as if I was at a gate and there was a being there. And it's, I felt as if this being could completely see absolutely everything within me. And um, in, not in any way, uh, unkind way or judgmental way, not in the slightest, in a, a way, let's call it grace, a presence of, of grace discernment, wisdom, awareness, far beyond anything I had ever experienced in this lifetime up until that moment with the exception of two experiences that I may have a moment to mention in a minute or later on. And I felt as if this being took everything that it didn't like that I couldn't take through the gate, just the same way at the airport you go through the security gate and they pull out a few things and say, nah, you're not taking that on the plane. And then I found my way outside to throw up and I realized that's what was clearing is everything I couldn't then I went back into my place and I sat down and a voice said to me pay attention you're in the training so <clears throat> being able to discern one's entirety there is this presence and it may be experienced um, in different ways we'll come to that in the next slide so there's an experience of unity cosmic consciousness a transcending universal light next slide please 
I just like this slide. <laughs> so there you go. The expanding consciousness. Uh, this portrays a lot of the colors, vibrations, uh, sounds, uh, shifting awareness. So the cartography, what are we exploring? The personal, the internal world. Issues often difficult to accept. It's as if we are shown the best of ourselves and our shortcomings, our limitations, our errors, our mistakes, um, but from a place of grace, a place of non-judgmental, just here it is. You get to look at it. There's body sensations, energetic experiences, sensory experiences. Some people work deeply with the chakra system and they will feel, um, this is very classic in the Santa Daimi, is to have see your chakras, have your chakras be opening, cleaning, clearing, uh, revealing things to you. Transpersonal experiences beyond the personal, uh, often intense, rich in meaning. They can be archetypal, they can be shamanic. Um, very uh, profound mythological experiences, connections with um, these archetyp archetypal realms and divinity realms. There can be mystical or near-death experiences. This is very common to feel, I'm dying. We, we will even have people go into what we call the healing area and somebody will call me over um, if somebody's really feeling quite frightened the guardian will ask me to speak to somebody and they'll clutch my hand and say I'm dying and I will tell them what Stan Groff said if you get an opportunity to die take it it's not a physical death it's a psychological death it's the death of illusion it's the death of of faulty sense of self and faulty sense of the world so there's encounters with invisible realms and dimensions and encounters with forces, energies, beings and beings that have the sense of other. Um, the sense of other, is that clear what I'm trying to say? That there's this sense of other in the non-ordinary state. We have it every day. You know, our cat comes into the room, we sense our cat or our dog or our partner. We go for a walk and there's other people around and other creatures and other things. So we're used to having it in the material realm. We're not used to having it when we go in our head, when we go in our meditation. There's usually just us in there, right? The, the world of me. Does everybody understand that? There, there's the world of me in which I'm in this bubble of me. And then all of a sudden in, in the non-physical world, there's this sense of other, and it has a very definite vibration. It can often have, um, these beings will often give you their name. That's what I teach people who come into our church. If you meet a being in the daimi, honor it, respect it. If you don't know who it is yet, and ask, who are you? They will often tell you, not always, but they will often tell you who they are. Uh, next slide, please. How are we doing time-wise? Oh, we've got a little time. So the encounters. We encounter divinity beings, angels, celestial beings, ascended masters, semi-divine beings uh, from all different um, paths and traditions. And we have to trust if we meet a specific being that we are meeting that being for a specific reason. That that being has something to teach us, something to show us, something to reveal to us. That there's something about their life, their teachings, that path that is important to us in this moment in our life. We can encounter deities from antiquity and other cultures from the one that we would consider our culture, even our ancestral culture. The uh, Orishas, the Orishas, uh, Kaboklos and Kaboklas, uh, these are beings that operate within the line of the Santo Daimi and some other lines. Um, in, in traditional Brazilian practice and some African practice. These are, these are being Orishas, are the forces of nature. They are profound. You encounter an Orisha, it's a profound experience. Kaboklos and Kaboklas are helper, guardian beings. Um, and often we will find that we've had uh, beings uh, walking with us in our lifetime that they've actually made a commitment to help us in this lifetime, that we have a karmic agreement with them, that they will help us by being our guide, by giving us, by guiding us. And, and you know, again, I can't see you. Um, hopefully in a few minutes we can have time to ask questions and I can get to look at you. Um, but um, I'm sure some of you have had the experience of a personal guide. Um, 
and whatever form that takes how that however one experiences that and and relates to it but there's something it could be a voice a presence it could show up in a very shamanic way it could be a um, you know a dolphin or an eagle or a bear and it should could be a very archetypal way so uh, and it's all fine so we can meet shamanic transforming or ship shape shifting ship shape shifting sorry beings uh, what's called extraterrestrials please don't think you know roswell um uh, extraterrestrials meaning not human not cats dogs cows so something that we're not used to on uh, so beings that appear to come from um, some other realm that and don't ask me to explain this because I can't explain them I can only say that people experience them uh, entities trickster forces uh, this is very shamanic the trickster trickster forces are there the coyote energy and uh, to see are you awake hello are you awake okay are you paying attention that's what trick don't don't be frightened of tricksters they're trying to help they're the rumble strip on the side of the highway you know when you fall asleep at the wheel and your your car drifts and there's that shaking the rumble strip to wake you up okay trickster forces are to wake us up people will report meeting dark beings demons monsters and beings related to death again something to teach us when we open to that um, there's a wonderful story of the of the buddha uh, i'll quickly share and in which the buddha apparently uh, took some of his um, more recent apprenticeship apprentices and took them to a forest and said you go in and you spend the night and you meditate and they went "Ooh, but that that forest has a reputation of being haunted you know i don't think we know if we're going to go in there and meditate no you're going to go that's your next step go in there and meditate so the next morning buddha comes along and and the the young students are coming out of the forest and they're all trembling and shaking and angry and you made us go in there and there was there was monsters and demons and, and he looks at them and he says you didn't meditate did you and they all fell silent and he says okay tonight prepare yourself because tonight you're going to go in and you're going to meditate meditate the way i taught you to meditate so in they go he comes by the next morning and they're all peaceful and they say oh thank you thank you but I thank you we went in and we opened our heart of compassion and we meditated and all those difficult demons transformed and went into the light okay who else do we meet we meet discarnate beings um, this is really common if you do the uh, near-death experience uh, research you'll find that this is really really common in near-death studies uh, next slide please we have just a couple of minutes left um the hero's journey joseph campbell i hope some of you are familiar with his work if you're not and you have a little time please look into it the greatest mythologist of the last century i wish he was still around next slide please so the hero's journey um there's the call and I can only say this again and again. Uh, there is a calling in Theogen's The Plants Call. And the beings who work in the line, for example, in the Santo Daimi, there's certain beings, you know, Nestor Reneo, it is said, walks the line. And he calls. He calls. And then the plants will call. And this is part of the belief. We don't solicit. In the Santo Daimi, it's prohibited to proselytize or solicit people. Um, we do not permit it. And if somebody does do it, it is against the principles. And the reason we don't is because we deeply recognize that it is a spiritual calling. And that this should never be put. Religions and belief systems should never be imposed on people. The calling, the spiritual calling, must be the seed that is within, that we incarnate with, that then calls to be planted and bloom. So in the hero's journey, there's always the call, the departure. We have to get in the boat and sail off. We have to pack our knapsack and head into the forest. And, uh, you know, this is a whole year long, not just a semester, the study of Joseph Campbell's work. 
that I just want to give you the table of contents uh, so that you understand that this can easily be applied to um, the, uh, the traditions that use entheogens, that it, they really are part, they can be parsed out as the hero's journey. There's the departure, the answering the call, okay? And then there's refusing the call. <laughs> it's like, no, that's too scary, I'm not going to do that. And that awakens a whole bunch of other things. Um, there are some, um, there's some many people who believe that when we refuse the spiritual call, even if we do it with dignity, if we do it with respect and dignity, it's a whole lot better than if we do it just from fear. So then there's the initiation. We've answered the call and we begin our initiations. And an important one is walking alone. Next slide, please. So there's a time when we look and we say, wow, I'm out in the desert, or I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. That's a very common initiation that a lot of people have to go through, and it's a difficult one, um, and you get to learn a lot when you're doing it. So walking alone, we will often feel alone, and, and that's why is that such an important initiation? Um, this is why there's vision quests and there's these rituals where you do have to go walk about and you do have to go. Why Mastery did have to go one week alone with the plants and just water and manioc and drink every day. Because you need to have these initiations so that you find the courage, the strength, the confidence and the faith within yourself. And that you quiet yourself to, to listen to the voice, that, that small silent voice that becomes somewhat louder uh, when we are in relationship with entheogens and um, to be able to listen and to discern and to be able to see and understand even if it's just the next step. Next slide please. Along the way there's dark nights and difficult passages. This is part of the hero's journey. Uh, Stan Groff used to share with us why is there evil in the world? I'm sure there's lots of answers. Uh, the bottom line is, is to thicken the plot. I like that one best. Okay, then there's the near-death experience. Um, everybody is going to go through something that feels like a near-death. And that will be individual. It can be very archetypal. It can be the phoenix where everything goes. Um, where something happens in your life. You know, your job, your marriage something enormous happens and then life as it was is now gone in the fire it's finished and something new must emerge from that it's the snake shedding its skin it's um, the caterpillar becoming the butterfly so there's that need for something old and that will that cannot be taken into the next chapter that needs to go then there's the return the return is, we all have to return. Uh, we have to return from up the top of the mountain. We have to return from our experience in the daimi. We, we come into, back into our everyday life. And we must bring our teachings, our transformation, and what we've learned. I've had people through the years share with me after they've participated um, in a work. They say, I met a being, and the being said to me, why are you here? Why are you here? You came before and I gave you some teachings and you haven't done those yet. Don't come back until you have. That's pretty powerful. Don't come back until you've done those. Now, what people don't understand if, is if you were to go to a very traditional, um, let's say, Zen master, that's what he would say to you or she would say, don't come back until you've, if it takes you six months, go and work with this technique. We are used to, in our culture, we're used to instant, now, immediate, um, quick, the, the, the shortcut, the instant. Um, it's, our culture has changed and we need to go back to learning patience and presence and awareness. Now some people refuse the return. We had once very interesting, I was staffing with uh, Stan Groff at a large retreat and um, there was a very interesting uh, experience where a woman went into her breathwork experience and she refused to come back. And uh, so here's, here's Stan Groff, Jack Cornfield, you know, kind of kneeling beside her, talking to her, trying to. And it turns out that she was a high-paced, high-pressured lawyer in New York City, you know, with the, the life, okay? And that the first time she'd experienced peace, peace. 
tranquility, a sense of inner, I can let go, it was in this breathwork experience that a friend had talked her into participating in. And she didn't want to come back. I, I don't want to go back to that life. Okay. So, you know, step by step, helping her see that she could come back from the breathwork process, that maybe she wanted to examine her life. And sometimes that's what the refusing the return is about, is I have to go back and face that and deal with this and change that. Yeah, and that will take courage and ask for support. Okay. Okay, great timing. Last slide, please. Or second to last slide. So have faith in the vision. Trust the universe. Plan well and do as planned. People tend to forget that one. There's a whole lot of trust the universe and yeah, well, who, you, you, you have a role in this. You have to plan and you have to do as you plan. Okay, and then once you've done that, then you relax and be willing to accept all possible outcomes. Right, um, la uh, last of the last slides is just a bit of recommended reading. Uh, there's our website for those of you who haven't had a look. Uh, all the work of Dr. Stanislav Grof, uh, near-death experiences, Kenneth Ring. I had the pleasure of, of knowing him way back, way back when. Um, a remarkable man who was one of the first doing, well, well, Raymond Moody was, but Kenneth Ring took it scientifically and, and academically into the next step. And then John Hagen, MD, his more recent uh, compilation of the science on it. Um, those of you interested in some of the work of Ayahuasca, here's just a few. I, I've put Vila Batty down on the bottom because I think that she is, those of you who are interested in the research, that if you go to her website and then follow on to some of the other websites that connect, <clears throat> then um, uh, that those are good routes to take. Um, there's a lot that's been written. There's a lot on social media. I would say be very careful what you read. Um, because there's a lot of nonsense out there, and be very careful. Um, I don't think I have anything to add as far as recommended reading goes. Uh, uh, there's um, wonderful fields. As I said, the near-death experience would be a really interesting um, background, and some of the other transpersonal psychologists as well.